Are you looking for truth from God's word that you can understand and apply to your life? You'll find it today on Make It Clear with Dr. Stan Pons, Bible teacher and president of Clarity Christian College, formerly known as Florida Bible College. Listen now as Stan makes it clear. But now, if you want to have a wild, dumb ride, take your eyes off of Jesus. And folks, I'm as serious as a heart attack right now. There are people listening to me today that would give a witness to say, I placed my faith in Christ to take me to heaven, but I got my eyes off of him, and I have memory scars that I live with today because of it. In fact, I'm in this room today because I'm trying to heal those scars and put my eyes back on the Lord again. And that's why this next verse is put here for us to look at as well. I need to keep my eyes on Christ. Not to keep saved, but because the ride I'm about to take can be pretty dangerous if I don't keep my eyes on Him. Here's what it says. Therefore we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us. And then it says, and let us run the race that is set before us. So basically it's just saying we're in a, we're in a race, a race of life. And in that, we've got to lay off some of the stuff that's going to cause us to stumble, get into some problems, get rid of the weight, get rid of the sin. But now, here's the positive. It says this. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. Now, in the, in the original language, looking works okay in English because I do have to look at it. But in the original language, it's a little bit more stronger than that. And it talks about fixing. Look at this. Fixing my eyes on the Lord. Those of you that perhaps know about these fighter pilots and they've got a fix on the enemy airplane in front of them before they shoot the missile. They've got to zero in and they fix it on that. And so as I live my life, I need to fix my gaze on the Lord. I've got to fix my eyes. We might say, turn my focus of all my tension on Jesus Christ. One translator used this. He says, looking away from all else and now looking to Jesus. So it's a choice now of saying, I can be easily distracted. There's a lot of stuff that can distract me. But i got to fix my gaze on Jesus Christ. And it goes on in that passage from there. Now, it was kind of interesting. I'm in my little MGB, the top's down. And by the way, if you don't know this, your speedometer does work when you're being towed. But this was beautiful fall time of the year, late fall, Thanksgiving. Leaves are all changing, and I'm behind this van in front of me, and I thought, how, how hard could this be? I'm 10 feet away, and I'm going to enjoy this ride. So I begin to look at the scenery around me, and then I get a little bit bored, and I want to see what's... And this is dangerous. I wanted to see what's in front of me besides the van. Now, when you're in a little MGB, and that's a big, wide van, you can't see anything. So I thought, this is cool. It's like water skiing. So I zipped out this way, and just as I did on this two-lane, little windy, hilly road, there's a truck coming right at us. And so I whiz right back again, and I realized I have got to fix, I have to watch. Then I started to think, what happens if Johnny begins to stop his vehicle? You know what they tell you, if you're in a car, you have to have one car length distance for every so many miles an hour that you're traveling here, you know, and I'm 10, and I'm watching my speedometer because he is a maverick, we're going 40, 50, 60, 70 miles an hour, I don't know if he didn't like his brother-in-law or what, you know, but all I know is by then, I'm like this, I said, I gotta watch it, brake lights at any moment, you know, and really folks, don't ever do this because a deer could have run out in front of him and you'd have a different pastor today, all right, but that's the truth. Those of you are living with scars that you did not have to have. Yeah, maybe you weren't taught this and you did it by ignorance. I don't know, but scars are scars. Some of you right now, the Lord is saying, there's a truck coming over the hill and you're looking all around you. And right now you've got to fix your eyes on the Lord. Because it's going to be dangerous. Well, now let's go to the second. Because after you put your trust in Him, you have to go where Jesus leads us. Now, that's sometimes hard because a lot of us want the Lord because we want fire insurance from hell. Who wouldn't want that? Some of us want the Lord because we're lonely and we want to have a relationship, and who wouldn't want that? But the real issue of this whole thing right here is that God has a plan that's bigger than you and me. Did you hear that while you're taking notes? God has a plan that's bigger than you and me, but we fit into that plan, and He needs us and wants us. 
And there's a purpose for our life, but he says, now, you have to get with the program. So I want you to look at me because now I'm going to take you there. Now, folks, let me go back to that illustration about behind that van for a moment. I knew I had to be at the television station in Dothan. I didn't know how to get there. I had a map that I was following till the car broke down. Johnny knew how to get there. But now in order for me to get there, I couldn't take a different route there. I had to get to the Dothan TV station based on the route that Johnny chose to take. Now I could be in the back of my car and I could be grumbling, I don't want to go that way, I don't like that way, you should go that way, that way, this way, you should go that way. What am I going to do? Well, most of us try to fight God and we are where we are. We don't want to be. Now, so what we have to do is we have to surrender. Now we're not talking salvation. We're hooked up to Jesus. Now we're talking to go to the next level in our walk with God, in the journey of life, in fulfilling what he has for us that's much bigger than we can even imagine. And I'd like to say this, it's greater. So let's look at the verse here, Romans eight fourteen, and it's spoken to believers now. You're on the side, you've placed your faith in Christ now. You're now a Christian. He says this, for as many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons of God. And if you're in God's family, he won't take one of his children and send you to hell. The next verse says, I love this, mark it, let your eyes look straight ahead. In other words, keep focused. And your eye looks, look right before you. Ponder the path of your feet, implying that you can walk off the path if you're not careful. So look where you're going. And let all your ways be established. In other words, don't dilly-dally, you're right on Sunday, but, you know, you're wrong on Monday. Let all your ways be established properly. Go deep in your stability of your Christian walk. Walk the talk, talk the walk. Do not turn to the right or to the left. And the last it says, kind of like, and don't forget this, remove your feet from evil. Now, going back to my illustration again with my brother-in-law, that did mean this, and my brother-in-law said this. He says, you will not be able to see my hand if I'm going to turn left or if I'm going to turn right. He says, you watch my blinkers. And here's what I didn't know, and here's where this illustration, kids, kids, will break down. He said, when you are the, the, the back car, I have to let you know that I'm getting ready to stop then you have to be the one to slow both of us down because if I stop too soon, then you could run into the back of me. So you, in a sense, are going to be the one who slows us both down. Now, that's why this illustration breaks. There are a lot of people today that are so worried about running ahead of the Lord, you know, and so they, they break too soon. God sometimes wants to go faster than we want to go. How do I know that? Because we lack faith, and when God wants to move us, we're not willing to take that step of faith. We don't want to risk it, so we're always, why we can't, why not, not, why now, why do we have to do this, why doesn't somebody else do this, and we find all reasons why we can't, and the Lord is saying, come on, come on, come on, come on, the fields are already white, white on the harvest. So we have to follow him, keep our eyes fixed on him, as now the one who's behind him. That means, to do that, watch this carefully now, he says, Stan, you have got to go where my van goes. When I stop, you stop. When I go, you go. When I go to the left, you go to the left. When I go to the right, you go to the right. When I slow down, you slow down. Here's the word. I have to imitate what Johnny did. If I didn't, one more time, I'm heading for a disaster. Look, if you will, at this next verse. The wonderful Christ follower, Paul the Apostle, wrote this. He said, imitate me. Some translation says, follow me just as I also follow Christ. So I must imitate Christ. Now when I say imitate Christ, you might think, oh, he walked on water. I must walk on water. No, no, no. I heal people. He healed people. I must heal people. Not necessarily. Can I tell you what it really does mean? The character that Christ has, that's the character that I have within me. And by imitating him is by releasing him to live that life out through me. I want to be just like him. He's holy. I want to be holy. He loves people. I want to love people. He got dirty to serve people. I want to get dirty to serve people. He laid his life on the line to get the message of the truth of the gospel out. I, I want to leave my life on the line to get the truth of the gospel out. I do. You know? That's being an imitator of Christ. And I'm going to tell you, don't ever worry about it. Listen, Jesus Christ, when he is the one that you are following will never make a disaster of your life. 
Does that mean you won't get cancer? You might. Does that mean that a mate might not leave you? you? Might. You won't lose your job? Probably will. But what it does mean is that inside of you, you know there's something happening. It's called the witness of God. You know you're saved. The witness of God. You are where God wants you to be. Things are going to happen. And watch this. Don't put an, your own expectation on how you think God is going to bless your life. You let God bless your life His way. Don't you then put God into your calendar of when you have to get blessed. You let God have that calendar. And I promise you, watch this, the authority of a God who cannot lie says, if any man serves me, follows me, imitates me, him will my Father honor. He cannot lie. And that's for you and me. So Paul says, follow me, because I'm following Christ. On the contrary, following Christ makes my life thrive and triumphant. Look at the next verse I have for you in your little outline there. I want you to read this one out loud together with me. This is 2 Corinthians 2.14. Do you all have it there? Can you read it with me? It's a short verse. Read it comfortably, if you will, so we can hear together as a family. 2.14 says, Now thanks be to God who always leads us in triumph in Christ and through us diffuses the fragrance of his knowledge in every place. That is so interesting. Here's what he's saying. He says there's victory in Christ and the knowledge of Christ God wants to diffuse out so that other people can experience that wonderful fragrance of Christ. Guys, you're going to think you've got a real wimpy pastor up here. I hope I'm not. But I like our house to smell good. You know how houses can smell real special? So my wife knows that I don't like a house that smells like a barn or like a men's gym locker room. You know, so she has, was over at Costco and they've got this stuff where you can then take it out of the box and you get these sticks and you can stick it in this thing here. And it's got this chemicals in here that it, I think it's called a diffuser, is it not? Yeah, some of you are saying, oh. some of you don't know what I'm talking about. Your house smells like a barn, I guess. I don't know. I'm just joking. Just joking. Relax. Just joking. And so when she gets that, I mean, if the room is too small, you'll gag from all that chemical odor. I know you will. But it smells so good throughout the rest of the house. And I'm thinking, God says that he is triumphant through us. And we're triumphant through him. And that he did this so that his fragrance would go everywhere. And here's what he says. That he's willing that none should perish. Then he says, I want all people, desires, and it doesn't make it, but desires that people would be saved. And here it is. And come unto the knowledge of the truth. Now, for them to have the knowledge of the truth, that knowledge has to diffuse throughout society. And he says, that knowledge which is now inside of you because you are a Christian now can diffuse to other people. And now the question is, is how does that happen? How does that knowledge of Christ, who he is, so others can know Christ, can diffuse? Aha, good question. Go back to the passage now, the one we read to you. Here's how it's done. And Jesus, walking by the Sea of Galilee, saw two brothers, Simon and Peter and Andrew, his brother, cast in a net into the sea. They're fishermen. Then he said to them, here is the crux, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. That concept of diffusing of the knowledge of salvation, the knowledge of who Christ is and the full knowledge of him from salvation to the end of your life, all of that, he says, I will make you a fisher of men. And then he tells them to go out and do that. And then he calls others to go do this. And so you see a lot going on at that time that God desires for that message to go out. Folks, I'm about to make a statement. You might want to write this down. It's not in your notes. It's not on the screen. Then I want you to go home and I want you to think about it. Don't pick it too far apart, otherwise you'll lose the bigger meaning of it. But it goes like this. You can be a fisher of men. That means helping other men come to faith in Christ. You can be a fisher of men without following Christ. There are a lot of Christians out there that are going through the rote activity, obligation, guilt if they don't. They're underneath some motivation to do all of this stuff on the outside. But on the inside, they hate it. They don't want to do it. They're grumbling about this whole thing. And so they're doing this fishing for men in the flesh. They're doing it for all the wrong reasons. Maybe they're doing it because they'll get praised for it so they can have another way to give a praise report of how faithful they are, giving out the message and all of that. You can fish for men without following Christ. But listen, this is the truth. 
No one can follow Christ without fishing for men. When you truly follow Christ, I love this, this is so beautiful. He then makes you the fisher of men. When we're over here trying to fish for men, we are making ourselves a fisher of men. Does that mean that certain people won't come to Christ? Because I know that there'll be a lot of people that may come to Christ. But we won't be hooked to Christ fully and completely. And he says, I want to make you. I made you in my mind before you were born, male or female. I brought you in the world a certain time of life. I've given you a lot of life experiences, so I was already programming you so that when you would come to Christ, you now have the potential to now follow me. Now you trusted in me. Now you're going to follow me. And he says, let me finish what I started. I want to make you a fisher's man. Now God will take you and make you the most equipped, best, successful, effective fisher of men that, watch this, you can be. So it's not going to be, well, how many did you lead to Christ today? How many did you lead to Christ this week? It's going to be God taking you. So some of you that feel so inadequate because I don't think I can do this. I don't have the outgoing personality. It's not about personality. It's all about faithfulness. Lord, I'm looking at you. I'm going to follow you. I'm going to become what you want me to be. And as you do, now folks, this is where it gets very mystical. But when you surrender to his lordship, watch this, as a believer. And by surrendering to his lordship, you're also surrendering to his wordship. Which means the Lord reveals himself in his word. So as you surrender to the word from the inside out with your thinking and your heart, all of a sudden, things begin to happen in your life and you will become that true fisher of men. So these people that talk a lot about what I call them deeper leapers, they're way into the deeper life movement. The test of a person in a real de deeper life movement is how passionate are they to be a fisher of men? What are they doing to connect to lost people? And when you're a fisher of men, fish stink. People stink. I don't mean outwardly, but you know, life stinks. You stink. They stink. The whole world stinks. That's fish. But we're going to be out among them unashamedly presenting the gospel to him. Well, the question now is, what did these guys do that? They trusted him? Did they follow him or not? Look at the next part of the verse. Would you look at it with me? Here's how they responded. They, what's that next word? Immediately left their nets and followed him. It didn't say they immediately left their nets and fished for men. No, it said they followed him. Why did they follow him? Because they knew the Lord would make them a fisher of men. Going on from there, he saw two other brothers, James the son of Zebedee and John his brother, in the boat with Zebedee their father, mending their nets, and he called them. And what did they do? Immediately. Now notice as I read this to you. They left their boat. That would be their tasks. In other words, their tasks didn't trump their relationship with the Lord. And their father, which means relationships, didn't trump their relationship of following the Lord and followed him, which means their location didn't trump their following of Christ. Now, they still had a boat. They still had a dad. They still lived in that area of the world. But at the same time, what was on top of the list was following Christ. And so, well, here, look, look up here. Look up here. What they did is they emotionally untied themselves from their task, emotionally untied themselves from relationships, they emotionally untied themselves from location so that they could be mind, soul, spirit, and body fully following the Lord. Now we know the rest of the story. All these guys lived a ripe old age and they died in their sleep in a retirement home. No, none of those guys did. They all died brutal, horrible deaths. Isn't that horrible? Here am I preaching, trying to get you to do all this stuff, and I'm warning you that some of you might have to give your life. But wouldn't that be great to know that you gave your life in God's will than for God to take your life out of God's will, if you know what I mean? Well, now is the time for us to make a decision. We've heard the message from the Bible about following Christ. The first thing we need to do is put our faith alone in Christ. I'm going to give you a moment to do that because if you have the Son, you have life. If you don't have the Son, you don't have eternal life. Those of you who have trusted Christ, I'm going to give you an opportunity to turn your ear to the Lord again. And He's calling you and He says, would you follow me? Will you keep your eyes on me? 
I want to diffuse my knowledge to the whole world through you. And I want you to be a fisher of men. And I'll make you that. I'll help you reach others. And we've given you a list of ways you might learn there in the outline. But he said, I'll make you that fisher of men. I want to take your life and show you that you have real meaning. Just for a moment, get emotionally untied from your tasks, from your relationships, and your location. Let's pray, shall we, with every head bowed and every eye closed. In a moment, we're going to have communion with the Lord so that the spirit of following Christ can continue. A communion with Him, the one who's called you to follow. But for just a moment right now, I'd like you to have a conversation with the Lord. And maybe for those of you, you are now ready to say, I'm a sinner. I need a Savior. Jesus Christ is not only said to be a Savior, He is the Savior. And right now, Lord, I'm taking you as my Savior. I'm trusting in you alone to forgive me of my sin. Lord, I can't hook up to you. I can't promise this or that. I'm coming to you as a broken down car, a broken down person. I've done some great stuff and like to do other stuff, but as far as getting to heaven, I'm helplessly and hopelessly lost. And I'm trusting you right now. Jesus says, he that believes on me has right now everlasting life. Is there anyone in here that's coming to the Lord by faith alone and not by works and today you are trusting Christ as your Savior? Is there anyone here today doing that? I'd like to pray for you. So in a moment I'm going to have you slip up your hand and you'll do that silently. You will not have to come forward. I'm not going to have you stand up when I pray for you. I won't mention your name in my prayer. I won't describe you specifically in my prayer but I will pray for you and you know that. You, you, you know that. And if you don't, you will in a moment. Is there anyone in here today that with an uplifted hand would silently let me know that today was the day that you called upon the Lord to be your Savior? You transferred your faith from yourself and your works to Christ alone. And you'd like for me to pray for you. Is there anyone at all? Would you slip up your hand so I can see it real high, real high. Is there anyone at all? All right. Christians, how about some of you? Some of you are now maybe realizing that the Lord is calling you to follow him to put your eyes back on him remember who you're doing all of this stuff for you had your eyes on your job your eyes on other people you had your eyes maybe on yourself maybe even had your eyes on church or church leadership but right now you're going to say I appreciate all those people in my life God probably brought them in there for a reason and I'll, I'll figure all that out but right now I'm fixing my eyes on the Lord Jesus Christ and I want to be an imitator I want to be like him And I want him to make me a fisher of men. I want his knowledge to be diffused throughout all the world. And and pastor, would you pray for me? Because I'm coming back. I've decided to follow you. Is there anyone in here by an uplifted hand that would say silently, Pastor, would you pray for me? I'm I'm coming back. And I'm going to look to the Lord. Is there anyone? Would you put your hand up right now? Is there anyone? God bless you. Anyone else? God bless you. The rest of you, you don't have to raise your hand, but you will have to give an account of what you do with what you've just heard. And it's a wonderful life that we have. Let's pray. Our gracious Heavenly Father, I thank you for this message, and I thank you for those who, because you will make us a fisher of men, who will be a part of your forever family, and you will use us as the fishermen, perhaps, to bring them in to you. And I thank you for that. I pray that each one of us would realize that there's many people out there who are lost, who need the gospel, and that need to be loved on, and we have to build a relationship with them and care for them. And Lord, we need you to help us to become what you want us to be as a fisher of men. Help us to do a better job of being like you around our family who doesn't know you, around our fellow workers, around our classmates at school, or on our team. Or maybe our neighbors when they're outside working in the yard. Father, we put our trust in you. We thank you for saving us. And now we're going to fix our eyes on you. Because it is and has always been and forever will be all about you. In Jesus' name.
This is Joe Pons, and I want to thank you for listening to Make It Clear with the teaching of Dr. Stan Pons, founder of Make It Clear Ministries and president of Clarity Christian College. Make It Clear is dedicated to taking the Word of God with clarity into every person's world. It's the support of listeners like you who make the ministry of Make It Clear possible. You can provide your tax-deductible gift to Make It Clear online by going to makeitclear.org. That's makeitclear.org. Thank you for helping us make it clear. If you would like to have Dr. Pond speak at your church or event, please email us at tellmemore at makeitclear.org. That's tellmemore at makeitclear.org. Thank you, and remember to make it clear.